Hi, welcome to today's video and thanks for joining me. Today we're looking at number four of our five-part series on retirement myths. Today we're going to be debunking this myth that you don't need a financial plan or a retirement plan or an estate plan, whatever you want to call it. People say, I don't need a retirement plan. Retirement's not that difficult. It's actually not that complicated. I can figure it out with a calculator and I'll be all right. Well, actually, I have some news for you. After today's video, you're probably going to want to talk to a, an advisor and get your own financial plan, not time value of money plan. We're talking about actual financial plan, retirement plan. It goes much, much more into just time value money. And I'll share that examples or those examples with you in this video. And I'm going to share with you exactly real examples of how a financial plan has deeply impacted a couple or an individual. Um, it's going to be remarkable what you're going to see. So without further ado, let's get into why you're here today. You know, you have all of these questions bouncing around in your head about retirement planning. Some of them are anxieties and some of them are legitimate questions. You're just unsure. The number one um, financial planning, I guess, doubt or question that people have is, do I have enough money to retire? And you're probably asking yourself that. Do we have enough money to retire? Is our money going to make it all the way through a retirement? Um, like you have your doubts. And so all of these anxieties, these questions are bouncing around in your head and they're living rent free in your brain. And I would just simply tell you that the moment that you engage an advisor and get a, a financial plan done, things begin to change. You end up having a look of this guy, peace and clarity. I mean, it's the same guy in one situation, not sure about what retirement looks like. And then the next situation, it's peace and clarity. And you say, yeah, sure. Like, no, it's not really like that. Actually, it is. When you, if you could sit on my shoulder and watch the reaction that clients have once we go through a plan and they realize that everything is going to work out or we save them a lot of money in taxes, you can see everything just start to melt away. All that anxiety, all that stress just melts away and you start seeing them actually thinking about retirement and living and enjoying life and making plans. And so I encourage you to, to stick with it, get to an advisor and talk to them about your financial plan. Okay. A financial plan is seeing the outcome of your planning decisions before you commit to them. I have this in about every video that I that I have on my YouTube channel and it's absolutely true. Imagine, consider building a house without a plan and then in the middle of the plan going, hmm, I didn't realize we should put that over here and so on. Well, too late, you're already committed to the house. Well, when you have a financial plan and you're thinking about retirement planning or even how you invest your money, if you're near retirement, you have another 10 years to go, very critical about how you invest your money. And so having a plan to help you to shape and guide your planning decisions about how, what kind of investments you should have in your portfolio, kind of a risk return um, allocation model that you should have in your portfolio, um, what kind of withdrawal uh, strategy you're going to deploy once you're in retirement. Talking about that and working it out on paper and seeing the outcomes allows you to say, okay, you know what, I really don't like that outcome, but I, I prefer this outcome. It allows you to figure out which way to go before you, you actually put any money towards um, that investment strategy or, or that withdrawal strategy. So I, I encourage you to get um, to the, uh, the financial plan. I'm now going to lead you through some of the reasons why you ought to get a financial plan done. And some of them you're going to say, of course, that makes sense. And some of them you, it may catch you by surprise. So the first one is, I think this is the one that catches people by surprise, early retirement. As a result of you getting a financial plan done, how would you like to know? I mean, how would you feel if the advisor came to you and said, I can retire you two years sooner or four years sooner? What does that do for you? What changes do you make in your life right now, knowing that you can leave two years or four years sooner than you thought you could because the way that you've got your money invested, the way that you've got your expenses lined up, your withdrawal strategies all in line, that you've got all this uh, planning that's been done and says, look, man, you could get out of that job two years sooner or three or four years sooner. 
if you wanted to, the choice is yours. Do you want to do another planning scenario about what life looks like if you decided to retire two years or three years or four years sooner, how that would look compared to keep working to that age that you thought you had to retire? And we'll contrast that. We'll measure them against one another and that'll give you some more information to digest. That is by far, I think, one of the biggest things that I could say to you about a financial plan is, yeah, we're going to talk about taxation and estate planning and all these things. But I think for the most part, a lot of people would like to know, are you one of those? Put your comments below. Are you one of those persons that would love to leave work today or a couple of years sooner at least? Well, a financial plan is going to answer that question for you. And I saw it. I love giving that information with people because, you know, when you fill out this questionnaire and it says your retirement date, you're, you're planning on leaving at 63 or 65. And I put that into your retirement plan and we start building out your your planning scenarios. But then I look at the planning and I say, you could leave earlier. Has anyone ever talked to them about this? I wonder. Let's talk about when we get on that Zoom call. I'm going to say, by the way, did you know that if you wanted to leave a couple years earlier, you could? They had no idea. So I think that is by far one of the biggest single surprises that I see in couples or individuals is when I give that information to them. The next biggest one, and that's CPP optimization. What age is the right time for you to start to take your CPP? Now, I know this is one of the biggest hot buttons for everybody because all my CPP videos are like going through the roof. And so you all have questions about that. And so understanding with a financial plan when to take CPP is very individualistic. You'll see a lot of comments that say, always defer, always defer. And then I get the absolute opposite. I'm, I'm watching, by the way, and reading your comments on my videos and trying to reply to as many as I can. And I see you guys going back and forth, which I love. Um, talking about no take it as early as you can you don't know how much longer you're gonna live or we waited all our life to get CPP why why put it off grab it now so it's very individualistic so I'm gonna share with you actually three different plans where the CPP was taken three different times okay so let's look at this the first one is taking it early you can see here that they're taking this at age 63 and 60 so this is a couple and they're taking CPP, you see that, that, that 15605 there's the CPP payment. So there's an example of a couple that are taking what, $95,000 after tax income stream uh, in their retirement and they're taking CPP at age 60 and 63. Then you got another couple that are taking it at 65. Again, there's, it's not about, you know, this is $78,000 of after tax and the other one was 95. It just happens to be this person's got a pension plan. They got a pension coming in. They're thinking about what is the impact of the CPP, um, taking it early um, and then taking it later. And we look at is there going to be any old age security issues with this couple? So we looked at what's the right age and it turns out 65 was the right time for this couple to take CPP. And then here we are deferring to age 70. This couple or this individual said, look, I don't need that high of an income in retirement. It's just myself. I don't have kids to worry about. And so I don't need this high income. And so and I've got a, a small part time income. You can see that nineteen thousand eight hundred dollars there. They've got some income. They don't have to worry about um, needing the extra capital right away. So they de push that CPP payment off age 70. So there's three different examples of three different timelines people are choosing based on our planning of when's the right time for them to take CPP. The next reason to get a financial plan is this right here. And I see this all the time in just about everybody that I start financial plans. They're if they don't do something, they're going to leave way too much money behind in their RIF account or their RSP for Canada Revenue to tax them. This is a huge problem. And so when we dig into doing financial plans, it's one of the things we want to look at right away is how do we get that balance melted down so that you're not having to deal with um, that problem. What you're looking at right now is the RIF minimum withdrawal schedule. What is that? That is when you take your RSP and you have to, at age 71, convert it to a RIF or any time that you want to, um, like if you're 65 and you want to do it, 
it's just based off of your age. This is the amount of money that you have to take out of your RIF, and it's based off of your age. So if you look at age 65, you can see that amount is 4%. At age 66, it's 4.17%, and so on. You see how it goes up and up. As you get older, you have to take out a higher percentage of your RIF balance every single year. Look at age 90, it's close to 12%. Now, one thing that doesn't, it may not jump off the page for you, but this idea of like, why would you have money left over at a much later uh, time? Why didn't you get through all of your RSP money or all of your RIF money through your lifetime? Well, think about age 65 and the minimum withdrawal is 4%. What is your risk tolerance or what is your return um, at that particular time? Are you getting 5% or 6% as a return in your portfolio, but only taking up 4%? So you can see actually in those years, your portfolio return might equal or exceed the rate that you're withdrawing. And so that means your actually your RIF account is actually going higher, not lower in the earlier part of your retirement years. That is a big problem because you're trying to lower the balance, not increase the balance. You're trying to use your capital in your lifetime. And let's look at this illustration. This is a great illustration um, to explain what I've just talked about. You're age 30, you start working your first job, you contribute to your RSP, and then let's say age 65, you decide to retire, and you have close to $900,000 in your RSP account. And for whatever reason, you decide to riff this account. I'm not going to get into, is that a good idea or a bad idea? Just, let's just use this. At, at that particular age, you decide to riff your RSP, and so it goes from an RSP to a RIF. Nothing changes. The investments are all the same. Nothing's changed. Just the title has changed. But what it means is you've turned on the tap and the income starts coming out. That Back to that chart, 65 is 4%. So if we go back here, $900,000 of 4%, 4 is going to come out to you. And that's going to be included in your tax return as taxable income. Now, that RIF minimum withdrawal continues. At age 90, the person passes away and they have $400,000 in their RIF. And if, you, if that person is the last person, like so if there's a couple and your spouse has predeceased you and you're the last person, that's what we mean by last person, that $400,000 gets added to your tax return in that year. So you can understand what that means from a tax point of view. That's a lot of money. Close to 50% of your money is gonna be gone to Canada Revenue Agency. And that is not what you intended to do, that you're gonna treat Canada Revenue Agency as a spouse or a sibling, right? You're like, here you go, we're gonna give this to you at your passing. That's not what you intended. So that leads us to, well, what can we do about that? And we talk about, well, you've probably heard this before, an RSP meltdown. So the RSP meltdown works pretty simply what we're trying to do is find a timeline where we can start to do withdrawals of your RSP so that it doesn't mean that you're spending this money it could be if that's what your budget is but what we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take money over your RSP and be mindful of your tax rate and what it does for your estate value and so on and we're trying to take that excess capital that you're not going to need and we're going to put it redistribute it across your tax free savings account and your non-registered account. So it looks kind of like this, where the RSP balance comes down, your TFSA goes up, and your non-registered goes up. That's what the RSP meltdown is trying to achieve. But now that is a great lead into the next one that you get with a financial plan is a withdrawal strategy. I've said it over and over again in these videos. Most people have a contribution strategy and haven't developed a withdrawal strategy most of your life has been putting money into these investment accounts whatever reason you did the same amount every year whatever it doesn't matter you just kept depositing the money depositing the money but very few people are actually thinking about well what happens when i take the money out so i've said in other videos you have to be thinking about how you're going to take the money out that leads you to tell you how much money you ought to be depositing and to which accounts you should be depositing because your withdrawal strategy talks about which accounts, how much comes out of which account and the timing of that. And all those accounts also have different risk profiles. So your withdrawal strategy should be, is what is leading your decision about how to make your contribution strategy. 
Now, a withdrawal strategy is kind of like a puzzle, right? You're trying to fit all these pieces together. And think about what the pieces are. You've got your government benefits like Canada Pension and Old Age Security. And your questions are, when do I start that? Am I going to have a clawback in Old Age Security? How do we stop or uh, mitigate this uh, clawback of our Old Age Security? You might have some pension income and you're trying to make a decision, should you commute your pension or receive that monthly pension payment? And how does that relate to how much taxation you're going to have with Canada Pension and Old Age Security as well? You also might have retirement accounts like RSPs, tax-free savings account, non-registered accounts. And you're thinking, and I get this question all the time, which accounts do we take money out of first? Again, that's another piece to the puzzle. And then there's taxes. Taxes affect each one of those pieces of this puzzle, depending on how much you have, when you receive it. You know, deferring your CBP, you don't have to pay tax now, you have to pay tax later. So there's a lot of moving parts to a financial plan. And that's why a withdrawal strategy is so important because we start to fit these pieces together. It's, it is like a jigsaw puzzle because what we're doing is we're saying, if we put the, the, the pieces together in this order, this is what your life looks like financially and how you're going to retire. But if we rearrange the pieces in this fashion, you could have a completely different picture in front of you. And so that's why getting with an advisor to help you organize those pieces is so deeply important. Now, this is a really great illustration for you to understand withdrawals and how you invest your money. On the top or the left hand side is just the withdrawal rate and then across the top is your risk tolerance, you know, whether you're a balanced investor or an aggressive investor, whether you have a 60-40, so 60% equity and 40% fixed income, that's what that's across the top. If you look at that, back to that 4%, so at age 65, you were withdrawing 4% out of your portfolio every year. No matter, just about no matter what you do at 4%, how you, no matter how you invested the money, even just if you had it in cash versus if you had some equities or a lot of equities, you can see as you go across, that's the probability that your money is going to last throughout your lifetime. So at a 4% withdrawal rate, that's why when you hear that 4% rule, that's what we're really talking about, that your money, you, you won't actually outlive your money. Now, when you get into higher withdrawal rates, and I have people that say, I want to withdraw 10% of my money every year. Well, look at the bottom of the page here, 10% very little chance you're going to actually have any chance of that money lasting throughout your lifetime. So as you have higher withdrawal rates, um, it, it, you need more equity to make sure that the, your balances don't diminish too quickly. But at some point, it doesn't matter how much equity you have with a higher withdrawal rate, you're just going to run out of money. So a withdrawal strategy helps you to see exactly how much money you need each year, what kind of rate of return you need in order to maintain that, that uh, longevity of your money. And it all plays out so beautifully in a plan because it's laid out in front of you. You actually see, here's what you need. This is the rate of return. This is your, the amount that you need to take out. It's, it's just beautifully laid out. And it gives you so much confidence knowing that when the markets are going crazy and you're look, doing regular reviews with your advisor and you're seeing what is your, your actual return, like and how much money is coming out, you can have confidence that everything's going to be fine. Now, if you are worried about market volatility, then you need to check out this video up here on the three bucket strategy because I think this might work out for you. There are some pluses and minus with the three bucket strategy, but the theory behind or the structure behind, you could modify it. But essentially, I think it works beautifully for people who have a concern about market volatility. The first bucket in the bottom left hand corner is the where the money comes out of to spend for your lifestyle. So car payments and gas and your utilities and groceries and date night and everything else, right? That's got to come from somewhere. So someone who's got a, like a really, I don't say like a big uh, anxiety over the markets, but concern and rightly so the last five years have been kind of difficult, you might think, well, I, I really can't tolerate a lot of ups and downs, so I might want to take some of that money and put it to cash. Now, how much of that? Is it one year? Is it two years? Is it three years? That's up to you. But that idea, that first bucket is you having that money just in cash. Now, 
You could further split that money up into laddered GIC. So you've got for one quarter, you've got cash in your bank. And then every 90 days, you've got a GIC maturing to replenish that cash. So you, there's ways for you to still, you know, uh, get a little bit of a return for that cash component. Now, the middle bucket, that middle portfolio has a different risk tolerance than the first one. The first bucket has zero risk tolerance. It's in cash. The sec so the middle bucket has a risk tolerance that's different from that third bucket that's the top right hand corner. You can see that green area is much larger in the top right hand corner because it's more equity. So it's longer um, timeline, higher risk, but a longer time you're trying to get longer rates, a longer um, and higher rates of return versus the middle bucket. The middle bucket is the workhorse. That's the portfolio that you're going to have it allocated to the extent that it's going to replace the income that is required in the first bucket, the one year, two year, three year, whatever you've decided. So your, the amount of return that you need to generate and the amount of money that you have in that is equal to replacing how much you're spending each year. Does that make sense? So you have to figure out with your advisor, how much is that money that you're spending each year? How much money do I need in the middle bucket that generates the kind of return that can come into the first bucket to replenish that. And the third bucket, you know what it does, right? It replaces what you just took out of the second bucket. So that middle bucket. So it's it's just changing the way you've invested your money in your portfolio so that you can say, this is for a much longer rate of return, higher um, risk profile. It's okay, we're looking for longer timelines here. And the middle one is your workhorse. You want it to be fairly stable. Um, and I say predictable, you want a fairly predictable rates of return. If you could get with your advisor and just change your portfolio to look like that, I think you're going to have a lot less anxiety in your retirement. Well, there's the two people right there. I love this picture. Avoiding stress, you know, no plan equals unnecessary stress. Why would you want to put yourself through all this stress when you could just simply have a financial plan that has a withdrawal strategy and an investment strategy that allow you to not be so grumpy and worried like this couple here. Well, paying less tax. You want to pay more tax? I don't know anybody that wants to pay more tax. A financial plan, when I talked earlier in the very beginning about this isn't about time value of money, um, you'll see some people or some advisors will give time value money if you put this amount of money into an investment over this amount of time. Uh, at this rate of return, you're going to have X dollars. That That's just telling you time value of money. What you want to know is how much income tax is this financial plan going to pay to Canada Revenue? Think of it that way. Whatever you're doing today, you're writing a check to Canada Revenue Agency every single year. So your financial plan should address how to pay less money to Canada Revenue Agency without sacrificing too much of your life and the lifestyle that you want to have in retirement. So I'm going to share with you an example, okay? Now, this is not the picture of my clients, but I know my clients are similar to this. They're very happy. They're relaxed because they all have financial plans and we talk all the time. Um, it's one of the things that I like to do is I like to talk to my clients and see how they're doing. But besides doing reviews, um, I want to see them enjoying their, their life and their lifestyle and hear what's going on. But here is a, a really good example of a couple that came to me. The grand total that you see there is the actual amount that they were going to pay to Canada Revenue Agency over their lifetime since they started with me. So whatever, I think they're 47, 48 years of age. And from that age to the end of the retirement, or not the end of the, I guess, end of retirement until they were passing, they were going to spend or be charged over $2 million to Canada Revenue Agent. Year over year taxation of their investments and okay, all the way through their incomes and then their investments, $2 million. Then I said, well, let me have at it. Let me get to what's going on with your life and what you want to achieve. And it comes out $944,000. So a million dollars, more than a million dollars that we're saving this couple to use in their lifetime, to give to their kids, to give to their charities, to increase that lifestyle, to have a bigger dream of retirement now because they have another million dollars 
to spend. And I know you're saying, a million dollars, I don't even know if I'm going to spend a million dollars in my retirement. Well, get a financial plan, you'd be surprised how much money that you're going to give to Canada Revenue Agency over that 30 years of retirement and ask the advisor, can you improve on that situation? Can you save me some of that money so that I can have a better lifestyle, better retirement, give it to my kids, whatever that is going to be. But you can see this is an actual example, and I know it's an extreme example, but it's very common actually to see once you get a plan done, to see that tax bill drop dramatically. And the very last one, and we're done, and thanks for sticking around. If you like this video, please remember to like and share with everybody that needs to see this and hear this information. I love doing these videos. I spend a lot of time curating the information so that you can enjoy it and get a lot of it. So I, I'd love it for you to smash that, that, uh, that like button and share it with them. But, and remember, put your comments below. Okay, the last one is about estate goals. So I get, I mean, the mix here is, it's wild. I get people to tell me, look, I didn't get any money from my kids or from my parents. I'm not giving them my uh, my kids. Or uh, I get the other opposite reaction is I'm going to live off of forty thousand dollars a year because I want to elevate the amount of money that's going to my kids and my grandchildren. So I I have to respect both, and I have to make plans that that address both of those goals. Right. So your goal might be in elevating your estate value. It might not be, but I'm pretty sure you're going to have these items that you want to have a, some kind of impact on. You might have children that are, maybe you have a, a small business and one of the children are in the business and the other one isn't in the business. So you're trying to figure out how do you have equalization between the kids, right? The one child's going to get this business that's your baby and that you, you built. And the other one is like, what about me, right? So you gotta have some kind of equalization. Now, if you don't have a business, then you also are trying to figure out how do we give equally to each of our children if you have children? So there's a, a big issue there. The other thing that I see a lot of as well is blended families, people who have multiple marriages with multiple children through different wives. Um, it sounds bad, that's not what I meant. I just meant that you've got like second marriage and you got some kids, right? And you've got your kids come to the marriage and her kids come to the marriage and you're trying to figure out how do we equalize this across our kids or how do I protect the value of my estate for my biological children because she's going to do that for her children. Like, so there are different goals for everybody when it comes to an estate, especially around equalization. You also want to pay less tax. We just talked about that before. What does your estate look like? So when we're doing that RSP meltdown and we're looking at which accounts to take money out of first, we look at not just what is the year over year taxation on your estate, but we look at what is the overall taxation of your estate and what is the estate value look like as a result of making those decisions. And so that, again, that's seeing the outcome of the planning decision before you commit to it. Charitable giving. I have clients that say, you know, we are giving to charity now and at our passing, we also want to give a nice charitable gift as well. Can you integrate that into our planning decision as well? Dependent children, people who have um, children with uh, disabilities and you want to know how do I put money aside for them so that there's money available to help them throughout their lifetime, but not to just simply drop it into a checking account. Are there certain products that you can put this money in so that it's protected from anybody that might uh, try to get their hands on it, but will be available to the children as well as they, uh, are they're, they're older and their needs are being met. And then the last one is maximizing your estate. If you have a goal to maximize your estate, having an advisor who understands who can do estate planning and then also give you guidance about how to elevate your estate then that's great you know i'm an insurance advisor as well so i can talk to my clients about well what can we do with life insurance that might create you know you put in uh, one dollar and it gives you three dollars depending on how much how old you are but it, it multiplies your money. That, I want you to think of life insurance as just multiplying money. You're putting money in and it multiplies it at your, at your passing tax-free. And that's how easy it is to multiply and maximize your estate. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video. That's it. We're, we're done. Why you should have a financial plan. Did you change your mind? Put your questions below, your comments below. Did you change your mind about 
um, getting a financial plan that you think, you know what, yeah, I should be talking to an advisor about doing a, getting my own financial plan. That's what I want to see because it's so important that you get a financial plan because it's going to change your life. It's going to make your life so much easier, less stress, you're going to have more money. It's just that simple. And um, I appreciate you sticking around through this video. It was a little bit longer, but it was a big topic and I, I'm glad to have uh, put it uh, onto a video for you. Thanks again for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Take care.